Welcome to Legacies, a journey through the interesting lives of elders. This program is brought to you in conjunction with the Cambridge Health Alliance as well as SCAT TV. This is a program in which we showcase elders and share their experience, strength, and hope with you. We hope you enjoy it. Today we have Louise Marks. I'm excited to have Louise here today because this is a show unlike any other show that we have done, uh, Louise. So thank you for being well, I here. I like being unique. <laughs> well, you definitely are. <laughs> and Louise, you are a gay woman, is that yes, correct? Yes, I am. And uh, so that's the exciting part of it because we haven't really focused on that. And I think that that's an important piece. So you are, do you mind telling us how old you are? Well, I'm going to be 69 in a couple of weeks. Oh, well, early happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, so you grew up through the, you were born when, 49? 48. 48. And you've grown up through the 50s and the 60s? Yep, I did. And uh, we didn't talk about these things then. We didn't even know that they existed pretty much then. I didn't. Or I That's didn't. That's for sure. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't either. Uh, well, not in the 60s. Well, not in the early 60s anyway. Yeah. So tell us how that was for you growing up and tell us about the feelings that you had and that's what we're interested in and, and, and also the bridge to where we are today with, mm -hmm. with the whole thing. Well, the first time I heard the word queer um, in relation to being gay, I was in a little grocery store up the street from where I lived. I was born in Gloucester and I lived there till I went to college. And, so, and, and someone said, do you know what the word queer means? And I said, yeah, it means odd or strange or something. And then they came over and they whispered in my ear and told me that it meant someone who was homosexual. And I had, that was the first time I heard it. And I found it shocking, I, you know, because I was probably like, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. So I was 11. really, really young. I had no idea that I was gay at that point in time right. whatsoever. I mean, it, it wouldn't have crossed my mind, you know. I think everybody just assumed that they were straight. I mean, you right. didn't think of, it wasn't an option. Well, we had the Nelsons and we had Leave It to Beaver, and we those were our role models, yep. right? That's what we saw on TV. So why would we think anything different? Right, and there was never anything on TV back then. Uh, and when I was in high school, I had a boyfriend when I was 15, and he and I went out for, I can't believe it, it was seven years until I was like 22. And um, so I thought I was straight. I assumed I was straight. But when I got to college, I started having feelings for other women. Um, you know, friends of mine, people. You told me about, um, do, you, do you want to talk about Donna? Oh, gosh. OK, yeah, I suppose I should talk about Donna. No, that was in high school. I said to you I didn't know until college. That was in high school. Um, she was a friend of, she was a next door neighbor of a very good friend of mine that I had met in uh, seventh grade. So, and Donna was several years older than I was, so she was ahead of me in high school. But we became very close, and there were actually three of us that hung out together, Donna and Nancy and myself. And somewhere along the line, I probably would have been like, 15, 16, something around that age, I started having feelings for her. And what I remember... And, th and this was right at the same time that you were going out with this young man? Yes, I was going out with Ricky at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I just remembered that I always wanted to be with her, you know? I mean, I just thought that she was the most fascinating person in the world. For <laughs> you know how you are when you're young, you know? Things right. just seem and she was older. So important. And she was two years older than I was. And, and I started having feelings for her. And I wanted to, I, this is what I thought. I thought, you know what? If I was a boy, I would kiss her right now. But I'm not a boy, so I can't kiss her. Um, but I had that impulse. Right, you had those feelings. And that was your first inclination? Yes. Yeah. That was the first time that I had that. Mm. And I never acted on it because, first of all, I didn't have it really conceived in my mind and you know I hadn't really thought through the whole thing about what it meant to be gay because you have to come to terms with it yourself before you come to terms with it with other people obviously. I'm sure I'm sure um, and so then this continued in college but what happened the first year I was in college which was 1966 
Um, I was at Northeastern. I was living in the dorm. I went home for Christmas, and um, Donna and I and her boyfriend, who she had just gotten engaged to, and my boyfriend, Ricky, were all going to go to Boston for the day. But what happened was her boy, she and her boyfriend got engaged, and they decided they wanted to go see her aunt, show her the diamond ring, and they didn't want Ricky and I to come along. So, you know, we just didn't go. And then the, the worst event of my whole life at the, up to that point in time happened. It, um, they took the train because it was snowing, and it was, I remember it was December 28th, and the train crashed in Chelsea into an oil truck. The, and the train burst, you know, everything burst into flames, mm. and the two of them were killed, mm. along with my boyfriend Ricky's cousin and several other people from my high school, and then others were burned. So it was a terrible traumatic event, and I knew when I was grieving for her that she meant more to me than just a friend. You know, mm. it really highlighted for me how important she was in my life. You were, you were devastated? I was devastated, mm -hmm. absolutely devastated. Is it okay if I use a tissue? No, go right ahead. Anyway. Uh, I'm glad you brought them. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> yes, I did bring them. Um, you know, here we are all these years later. It's like, <laughs> and I, I still have that, ter you know, I still have this terrible reaction to that loss. Well, I can speak from my point of view. I don't think you ever get over the feelings of your first love. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose that's true. Huh? I don't think you ever get over those feelings. Yeah. You carry those feelings with you forever, and it's a, it's a special thing. Yeah, and so. you know what's interesting? I still carry feelings for Ricky after all these years, too, because even though I ended up being gay, I was very attached to him and very fond of him. Yeah. So it's not like I, you know, I could just whisk him away and he became Erase him from your life. No, because I still have dreams about him even today. Mm. Fascinating, huh? It is fascinating. <laughs> the whole um, process that you went through, I think, is fascinating. As you said, you have to come to terms with it within yourself. So there's that um, wrestling yes, uh, back there and was forth. Yes, a lot of wrestling back and forth. Right. Because back then, like say the 60s, you didn't want to be gay because it meant, you know, you were ostracized by people. Um, it Including was the church. Very right. shameful. I right. was brought up as a very staunch Catholic. So I, that didn't fly. I, no, it didn't fly. <laughs> my parents um, were Portuguese, and my father was actually born in Portugal, but my mother. My mother was here, her family had been here for several generations, Generations, so she was much more Americanized than my father was. Mm -hmm. But even so, when I told her, I told her one Thanksgiving that I was gay, and, and she uh, was... How old were you uh, then? I was... Roughly. I, you know, maybe around 25, 26, oh. something like that. Yeah, it was much later. I didn't. So you be first became aware when you were around 15, 15 16? 16, yes. And then it, you had this whole process going on within yourself. And yeah. then now at age 25, you'd come to terms right. with yourself. Well, I had gone to college and graduated from college. And the other thing that was happening was the, um, you know, the environment was beginning to change. You know, Stonewall was in 1969. Okay. And then after that, they had the great gay And Stonewall pride. was? Stonewall was a riot in New York City um, where uh, it was a gay bar, and it was mostly gay men, although I think there were some women there at the time, and the police would round them up and, you know, throw them in paddy wagons and take them downtown. And on this particular day, they fought back, and they they barricaded the bar, and there was a huge riot, and that was like the beginning of the modern day gay rights movement. Mm. And then after that, they had the first march in New York City. Probably it was the following year, I don't know. And then Boston had one in 1971. And I went, I didn't go in 71, but I probably went around 75 or 76 mm -hmm. and marched in gay pride. And one of the things I remember back then that happened was we were marching down um, I think it was Boylston Street, and this woman came running out of a, a restaurant, and she went like this. <laughs> and it was like, it was shocking to me, because, you know, most people were very polite and kind and all of this. 
But, uh, you know, there were obviously people who were protesting, and she was one. <laughs> now they have thousands of people that join Gay Pride. Oh, oh. But Key how many? So in the, in the early well, years. It was smaller, but I can't remember how small. But it wasn't like, you know. Hundreds, maybe a couple of hundreds? Yes, it would be in the hundreds, but it certainly wouldn't go to the many, many hundreds to thousands it was today. Mm. So that was my, I don't know if that was my first Gay Pride, but it was one of my first Gay Prides. And then since then, um, I joined Olay when I was 40, and that stands for Older Lesbian Energy, and you had to be 40 to join. Uh, little did we know that 40 wasn't all that old, but... Uh, <laughs> it's looking anyway. younger every day, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> and in recent years, we, uh, we would march with our banner, Olay, Older Lesbian Energy. And, you know, a lot of us started to have gray hair then, and we would be marching down the street and people would get down on their knees and, and bow to us. And I thought, what a difference, you know, all those years so what later. Year, so 71 was, or uh, 75 was it? in the 70s, this was my first gay pride, yes. Right, and, and then. I'm talking about ones that, you know. And when was Ole? Ole was when I turned 40, so that would have been 1988. Oh, so it's quite a quite a few uh, quite a few years yes, later. Yes, yeah. it would have been 1988. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, and then so that so already there had been a change. Huge change. Yeah. Huge change. More and acceptance. It was more acceptance. By that time, I was out at work. You know, I told people that I was gay at work, and you know, it was interesting who it was hard to tell. It was much. It, well, I'm, I was, I'm a social worker. I was a social worker. So, you know, that's a pretty accepting Once a social worker, always a yes, social worker. that's right. And um, that's a pretty accepting profession. Right. But the hardest people for me to tell were the... Fellow? No. Oh. No, not my fellow social workers. Those people I felt fine with. It was telling the staff who answered the phones, the secretaries, the receptionists, oh. because they were of a different mindset from most of us. Mm. You know, they were less well-educated and they were, you know, more, they had more old-fashioned old fashioned ways, you know? Right. Uh, but eventually- Not as told, accepting, more yeah, rigid. not as accepting. Right. But, you know, finally, Why did you feel I compelled thought, to tell them? Because, it got to be an issue when you would talk about, you know, what you did over the weekend. Oh, I who see. You, you know, people yeah. talk about their husbands and their right. boyfriends and their girlfriends right. and this and that and the other thing. And what do you do? You sit there and you remain silent. Well, right. that doesn't fly. You know, after a while, you want to be a part of the group. Of course. And so eventually I told them, and they were fine about it. And yeah. now I just tell it, well, I'm telling this on television, so obviously there's nobody I'm afraid to tell any longer. Right. Yeah. So let's go back to your mother, when you told your mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing she said was, and this was after my father had died. My father died in 77. And this, what did I tell you this was? It must have been 78, because it was after he died. Anyway, um, it was Thanksgiving. The first thing she said, it was Thanksgiving. <laughs> I don't know if it was Thanksgiving Day, but it was that weekend. Probably mm -hmm. I didn't tell her on that day. I gave her a respite. <laughs> uh, and the first thing she said is, what did I do wrong? Mm. That was her first reaction. What did I do wrong? That she had failed. Right, that she had made a mistake someplace. There was something she did wrong. And I tried to tell her that she didn't do anything wrong. And then she told me that she loved me no matter what. Good. So this That's was promising. Good. This was good. <laughs> But then she said, well, as long as we don't tell anybody and nobody knows, it's not true. Oh. Hmm. You see? So I wasn't supposed to tell anybody. I had told my brother and my sister in law even before I told her. But um, And how were they with they it? They were fine. Yeah. They were fine. I think, uh, yeah, my brother was fine with it. And, so and did, she, did she then make a comment about your dad? Yes, she did. What she said to me was, if your father was alive, he would disown you. Mm. Well, that mm. really, and you know, you know, Roberta, that's probably why I didn't come out until after mm. he, you know, didn't that come out is to a, her. I, I can't imagine how that cut and pierced. Yeah, it was terrible because I was right. very close to my father. He died right. of cancer. And, um, but my father was born in 1906. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> life was different I, then. Life was very different. And he mm. grew up in a very conservative town. Right. Gloucester was not the place it is today. And he had very, you know, old-fashioned ideas. And he was 
much more old-fashioned than my mother even. He was nine years older than she. So, but he came from a culture, hurt. a particular it, yes, culture. It hurt me terribly right. when she said that. You know, and I thought, why did she have to say that? Even if you think it, right. you know, there's some things you just should keep to yourself. But, you know, that was, I think, a way of just showing me her great displeasure at all of this. Right. Mm. Yeah, it was rough. It was I'm rough. sure it was. I'm sorry you had to go through that. I am too, but you know what? Believe it or not, that that old adage is true. You know what? All of this stuff makes you stronger, and it it teaches you. You learn something from all of these experiences, even if they are very, very painful and that's very true. difficult to go through. You do learn something from each one of them. So that's the hopefully good, that's the good news. <laughs> that is the good news. <laughs> but so, at the time, it was horrible. At the time, yeah. it was horrible. So you were involved with some other groups, you told me, uh, uh, as well. Oh, gosh, one of the first groups that started was Gay Professional Women, GPW. And that was actually even before Olay. Well, you could go to that whether you, you there was no age limit on that. And they held it in people's homes. And I remember the first time that I went to it, it was in a, a big apartment in Brookline, and there were so many lesbians there that you had to, like, <laughs> you know, wend your way through. I mean, we were, like, wall to wall. And From sure, all walks of life? Yeah. Well, they were supposed to be professional. Right. So it was supposed to be, oh, right. you know, you're supposed to have some profession, like, you know, teacher, librarian, whatever. Doctor, lawyer. Yeah, Indian chief. Uh, there were none of those there that I know of. And, I'm not um, sure that's politically correct <laughs> these days. but <laughs> Oh, well, I have to edit that out. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I was, like, amazed that, first of all, there were all these... You weren't alone. Right, there were so many of us. And mm. after that, they had to start having them in venues. They had to rent halls and stuff because nobody's apartment could accommodate that many people. And uh, that group didn't last, but while it lasted, I met a lot of people, and you know, there was a softball subgroup from that that we played softball, and you know, they had events like at the chil they rented out the children's museum, and we had an event there, and wow. the, that Lars Anderson Park where they have uh, in Brookline where they have the old-fashioned yes. cars, they rented that out. I mean, that, I, that's my cut through every day. I <laughs> that's I cross that every day. So. Um, that was a great group. Oh, and the first one. Oh, how could I forget the very first one? D.O.B., the Daughters of Belitis. That's what I was just looking yeah. for. Yeah. They were met at the OCBC, the Old Cambridge Baptist Church. And I think that was the first lesbian organization. And it started out in San Francisco, actually. Oh. These two women, they wrote a book. And, uh, and they started D.O.B., and there were all these chapters. And we met up at the church, and we had rap groups. And so we would sit around and talk and have rap groups, and um, people would talk about being gay. But they would talk about other things, too. And we had. And you supported each yeah, other? Yeah, we supported each other, and we had all kinds of little events. And um, was it before? Just the, anyway, the weekend of Gay Pride, I don't know what day it was, we had a spaghetti dinner, and we had it up at the OCBC, and it was a fundraiser. And, you know, we just had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. It That's was good. really, really great. And I met lots and lots of people. Now, there you met people from all walks of life because okay. there was none of this professional. Anybody could join who was a lesbian. And at any age as well? Or was uh, that? You know, I, yes, there was no age limit. But I think everybody was pretty much 18 or older. Yeah, we probably couldn't have kids in it. I don't know. But, yeah, no, they were, you know, they were, we were adults. But And this was around what year? Well, I probably went to that in the late 70s. 70s. Because I think mm. that's when I started. I really just want to give sort of a timeline. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, that's when I started going to various events. You know, I started going to Gay Pride. I joined. Uh, you were participating. In, yeah. yeah. And then I started to, um, especially with um, Olay, I really met good friends in Olay. And, you know, we started to form friendships. And even though Olay disbanded a number of years ago, I still have friends from that group. That's wonderful. You know? And, uh, you know, we really, we spend a lot of time together and we're all a lot older. I mean, some of them are in their 80s now. Wow. And did you meet anyone? Did you have any relationship? Oh, I had my, f the first woman I was ever with, I met her in a bar. Her name was Judy. And 
that didn't last too long. But, you know, we were together probably a year or something. But they met, then I met this. And that was your first? That was my first. Mm. That was the first time I was ever with a woman. And uh, then I met this woman. Maybe I shouldn't give her name because. She That's okay. <laughs> we don't need to. G-O-B. And I met her at the spaghetti dinner. And I was very, very attracted to her. And we started dating. And it took me a little while. I guess it didn't take too long for me to catch on that she had an alcohol problem. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I tried to keep up with her in the drinking department, <laughs> which wasn't such a good idea, by the way, <laughs> let me just say. Mm. And, um, oh. So that didn't she, work out. That so didn't you... work out because of her alcoholism, yes. Right. So let's and fast finally, forward. I had to break it off with her. Yeah. So let's, I, there are a couple of things I want to touch on. I want to touch okay, on sure. your current relationship sure. um, that has lasted for a year or two. 25 years. <laughs> We've been together 25 years in this past July. I can't even believe it. It's shocking to me that it's been that long. And did you marry? Yes, we got married in 2009. We didn't get married right away because we had some issues to work out in couples therapy and we thought, you know what? We should really be sure before we do this, because all of our other friends got married like right away. When it was legal. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. it was legal in 2004. Right. So I want to talk about that. We've talked about your your beginning of your life and your process and within yourself and and within the communities and within life itself and your professional career. So today, so I want to talk about some of the significant events. You already alluded to one when we talked about a gay marriage was um, accepted in uh, Massachusetts, in right? Massa yeah, it was in two thousand four. At the time, in two thousand four. Yeah. And what other things? Um, the well, I so mean, you were a social worker, so right. you dealt with mental health. Yes, I did. Right. So you were totally aware that this was a diagnosis on the DM. Yes, the DSM. I, DSM. I forget which number it was because it's had a series of numbers. But yes, homosexuality was considered a diagnosis. A and mental disorder. A mental disorder, mm. absolutely. And people, you know, went to try and be cured of it. Uh, and then, of course, there were other people who argued that it's nothing to be cured of. It's fine, just the way it is. And it, in the 70s, I can't remember exactly when, but it was removed from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as a disorder. Mm. And that was a, huge, that was a huge thing. I mean, it made I big headlines because now it was no longer a disorder. Right. You know, it wasn't a diagnosis. Right. You weren't, there wasn't something right. wrong with you. Yes. Right. And that was acknowledged by a professional community. Now, that doesn't mean it was acknowledged by every other person, but once a professional community does that, you know, the psychiatric community, the mental health community, it has a powerful impact. I'm sure it opens the doors. Yes, it does. Yeah. And then the Supreme Court decision? The Supreme Court decision. Now, when that was, how many years ago was that? That was like... 2004 as well? No, no, that came much later. That's only like three years ago. Three years ago? Yeah. Wow. Yes. When it became a national, I think it was three years ago, 2014. I could be wrong on the date, but yeah, no, that was much more recent because I was in Provincetown when the decision was made and it was really fascinating. We were down there and we were waiting for the announcement, you know, and then and it came over the television, and then the town crier, there's a guy that dresses as a town crier mm -hmm. down there in the old pilgrim costume, <laughs> right. and he was out on the street ringing his bell announcing it, and it was wow. just fabulous. And then there was like a parade through town, and oh, it was very, very exciting because now gay marriage was the law throughout the land. Throughout the United States, yes. every every state. Right, all every state. Yeah, wonderful. So you've seen significant Oh. Um, so as a gay woman today, you're married, obviously, yes. and how do you, do you feel that life is different for yes, you? Yes, I do. It's very, very different. First of all, we, we lived in Cambridge, and we moved to Somerville in 2004. And, you know, we had a neighbors that were, you know, people who had lived in Somerville their whole lives. But right away, I thought, you know what, we're coming out to everybody. It doesn't matter who they are. Uh, Good because for you. people need to know. They need to know, and we need to feel comfortable. Right. You know, we need right. to feel comfortable. And you hid long enough. Right. And so, 
I thought, you know what, right away, Wonderful. I'm going to tell people that we're a couple. And it was never an issue with anybody. Yeah. You know, it's it's just changed Probably so because much. it wasn't an issue with you. Well, you're probably right, right about that, Roberta. Right. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. People tend to be more you accepting know? when we are comfortable in our own right. skin, right? right? And so now, you know, you can go anywhere and tell people, oh, this is a funny thing that happens in Market Basket. My partner's name is Faye. And uh, we're in Market Basket a couple of times. And we're going through the line. And what we do is we get two carriages and then... We put them on the belt, and then we pay for them. Each of us does a carriage to try and speed the whole thing up. So that <laughs> twice, the person behind the counter set, looks at us and says, are you two sisters? And I said, no, no we're married. <laughs> <laughs> and so each time I've said that, and it's great. And you know what? We've gotten, I don't know what they thought inside their heads, but it, they. It didn't matter. They said. What they said was, oh, that's great. There and, you go. You know, one said congratulations. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. And, you know, we ha I, I'm doing this story today because I'm, I'm excited about it. I, my intention in doing this show is to uh, raise a level of awareness and to raise some understanding and even compassion that it doesn't matter who we are, what we look like, what color we are, how we wear our hair. <laughs> it doesn't matter, uh, none of that matters uh, because we can all, even though we can't relate to circumstances, we can all relate to feelings and emotions. And we've all had the feelings of sadness, of uh, despair, of uh, depression, of not belonging and not feeling like we yes, belong, of feeling trapped. We have all had those feelings. And so it really doesn't matter who we are or how we express our humanity on this earth plane. The bottom line is that our hearts all beat the same and we are all looking for the same thing. And what is it that we're looking for? We're looking for love and the acceptance and healing that comes along with it. So thank you so much, well, Louise, for showing, for, uh, coming on uh, our show. Thank you for letting me share my story. Yeah, thank you and so I much. And I hope it's helpful to other people because you know what? Some people are coming out at much older ages. You know, I was in my 20s, but people are coming out in their 60s and 70s nowadays and even in their 80s. And so it's never too late. If, you're, if you have any doubts or any questions, just go to one of these organizations. And now not only, not only are the ones for the, the senior center has meals for gays and lesbians. That's right. Down at Riles. There Last you go. Fourth Wednesday of the month. In Cambridge. by the SNS. Right. Actually, my faith community is going to be begin one uh, next month, I think, that we're oh, going to be hosting you. an LGBT uh, cafe as well. So, uh, so it's, it, here we are. And in, in 2017, life has changed dramatically. And, and even the children, the oh, kids. Yes. Young and, people. And so there are organizations for them as well so that hopefully they don't wrestle so much and go through the persecution, um, both from yourself, your mother, and, and uh, society. Society in general. Yeah. Right? So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me, Roberta. You're welcome.